I would like to thank Michael and Andrea and Bo for inviting me here today and uh, really uh, appreciate this opportunity to speak to you. Um, as Bo said, the title is Ecosystem Response to the Removal of the Elwha River Dams. And I'd like to acknowledge all the different groups and people that have been involved in this effort that has gone on for decades. Um, instead of trying to list everyone, which I can't because there's literally hundreds, um, this just gives you an idea of some of the groups that have been involved. Particularly, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the Lower Elwha Klallam tribe, who was a really I just lost, oh, there we go. Uh, it was a really critical part of the dam removal as well as the U.S. National Park Service and um, several other federal agencies. And what you're looking at here is a pink salmon and a Chinook salmon. So we're gonna talk about these, these and others. So I'm gonna give you a brief overview of, just give you a map of where dams are across the world and what's going on in the United States talk a little bit about what we know about the Elwha fish populations prior to dam removal, introduce you to the concept um, of the United States Congressional Act of the Elwha River Ecosystem and Fisheries Restoration Act, and then I'll show you some photos of how the dams actually came out. Um, and really, the primary... I think I just... Again, I'm okay now, right? All right. <laughs> So uh, is really what has occurred since the dam removal. And I'm going to talk to you about that today as a function of place in the watershed, uh, the sediment story, the salmon story, and the ecosystem response. And again, here are two pink salmon, two male pink salmon. Uh, this is Glines Canyon Dam, the upper dam, um, during dam removal. Um, this is somebody who's a little over six feet tall, uh, a couple of meters tall there, to give you an idea of how big the dams actually are. So dams are across the globe, and if we focus in on North America, we have quite a few dams, to say the least. Um, but what's been happening since the 1980s is we've seen a pretty dramatic increase in dam removal. And this is for a variety of reasons. One of them is that dams age over time and they become safety hazards. And so that's part of the reason why we're seeing dam removal. And so the map on, the, uh, on your right, you can see where dam removal has occurred over the last 30 years, primarily in the Midwest of the United States and the Northeast, as well as the West Coast. And I'm gonna focus on the West Coast today. Most of the dams have, that have come out are 10 meters or less. So these are small mill dams, as we call them, that have come out. But the dams more recently that have been coming out, particularly in the, in the west coast of the United States, are much larger because we have much larger mountains there. So if we look at the North America and we focus in on the northwest corner of the United States, which is the states of Washington and Oregon, we see there are several dam removals with an average height of about 30 meters for these dams, so quite large. And I'm gonna today focus on one of them that I've been working on over the last two decades, the Elwha River. You can see it's situated here in the upper left-hand corner. So the Elwha, um, the Elwha watershed is a place uh, um, called the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State. And two dams were built in the early 1900s, one at River Kilometer 8 called the Elwha Dam, and another one in 1920 called the Glines Canyon Dam at River Kilometer 20. Now, when these dams were built, they cut off 90% of the habitat to salmon, and salmon are an anadromous species, meaning they spawn in fresh water, they spend a majority of their existence in the marine environment, and then come back to spawn in fresh water. So quite a bit of their habitat was cut off with these dams being built since there were no fish ladders. So the Elwha watershed is very similar to many of the other watersheds in the Pacific Northwest. It has an area of a little less than 1,000 square kilometers and a little over 100 kilometers of main river and tributaries associated with it. It's a shorter, steeper river going from about 1,400 meters to sea level and about 70 kilometers. And in terms of the climate of what we have, uh, it's warm, dry summers and cool, wet winters and a variety of tree species and a variety of geology. And this is just a map of the Elwha itself. And in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that most of the river is actually in national parks. So there's no roads, it's totally pristine, it's never been cut over. We have some pristine forest up there, and that, that's what makes the Elwha somewhat unique as well. 
So in terms of the different species of salmon, we have a wide variety of them. We have basically all the salmon that you could see except for the exception of cherry salmon, which we don't have on the west coast of the United States, in the Elwha River. So we have coho, pink, chum, chinook, um, sockeye. We also have uh, ocean-going rainbow trout or steelhead, which we'll get into. We also have salvelinus or bull trout, and then non-salmonids as well, such as eulicon or candlefish and Pacific lamprey. So a wide variety of species. The Elwha story is no different than any other watershed in the Pacific Northwest. Historically, we had a lot of fish returning, almost a half a million fish per year for all the different species. Currently, we have quite a bit less than that. And that's not just due to the dams, but what we call the four H's. Um, hydropower is one of them. Overharvest of fish is another one. Uh, hatcheries can have deleterious effects or negative effects. And then habitat degradation. So all those things contribute to the decline of these salmon populations. What people don't think about, though, a lot of times is how the species composition, if you have multiple species of salmon, changes with a decline in population. Historically in the Elwha, the dominant species in terms of abundance were pink salmon. What we see today, though, are Chinook salmon, uh, coho salmon, and steelhead. But all the populations uh, were in very low abundance prior to dam removal. So in 1992, and I, wanna, I want you guys to keep this in mind, this act was passed in 1992, the Elwha River Fisheries Ecosystem and Restoration Act. Dams didn't start coming out till 2011. So that's just something to keep in mind. But really what this was for was for the removal of the dams and full restoration of the Elwha River ecosystem, which starts basically with fish like this. These are two Chinook salmon looking at you right here, um, two males um, getting ready to spawn in their spawn colors. So one of the biggest issues, because these are big dams, one was about 30 meters, the other one was a little over 60 meters in height, was what was going to happen to all the sediment that accumulated behind these dams over the last 100 years. This is a photograph on, the right -hand, on your right-hand side here of the, the delta uh, going into the upper dam. Um, so that's the sediment. You can see how much it was. When you add up all the sediment, it was over 20 million cubic meters of sediment, most of it being the size of sand or less. And about half of it was predicted to erode downstream once the dams came out, which is what we wanted. Now, that would have some initially some negative effects in terms of the, the suspended sediment levels in the river that can potentially harm fish, the deposition of sediment in the pools. Um, but it, and it would also build up the riverbed, or grade it, as they call it. And, but it would also create an estuary where we didn't have one um, for the last 100 years in terms of being supplied by sediment. So the Elwha Dam was at River Kilometer 8. And this is what it looked like literally the day they started to take it out. Um, again, it was a little over 30 meters in height. And it basically had a little less than 5 million cubic meters of sediment behind it. Um, you know, and so most of that was silt and clay. And the way they took this dam out is that they created a coffer dam or another dam above it and pushed the river to one side of the river valley and then deconstruct it on the other side. And then they would push the river back to the other side and deconstruct. They started this in September of 2011, but by April of 2012, there was fish passage. And that's just the lower river, uh, the lower dam. Now, the upper dam, which was located at River Kilometer 22, so we had that space in between, was much bigger and a lot more complex. This one was over 60 meters in height. It's a concrete arch dam. And that housed a little over 15 million cubic meters of sediment um, above that that was going to be released to the river system. So the way they did this one was they had a barge with a very large jackhammer on the upstream side, and they pounded a couple meters a day, essentially, of the dam down. And eventually, there was no more reservoir. In other words, they got the dam down to the point where you couldn't float anything, so they had to helicopter in large equipment. This is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> and eventually, they got the dam down to about, I would say, 10 to 15 meters where they could actually blow it up. So it wasn't, it wasn't something where you just put a stick of dynamite and you say, boom, and then it goes away. It's not, that's not the way it works. 
Um, and eventually there was fish passage to the majority of the, of the river system. So remember, this is River Kilometer 22, and it's about 70 to 80 meters, or 70 to 80 kilometers long. So now I'm going to talk for the majority of the talk about what actually has occurred as a function of place or location, and then the process, the ecosystem process is associated with it. I'll tell you a little bit about the, I talked a little bit about the dams, I'll talk about the, the former reservoir areas, talk about the estuary of the near shore, and then what happened in the river itself. And then in terms of process, we're going to talk a little bit about how the sediment was routed through the system and how that impacted the fish, re re the reoccupation of fish in the upper watershed, and how that links to the river food web. Um, and then also terrestrial linkages, meaning to basically animals, and then the revegetation, particularly of the, of the different new surfaces that are there. So what I'm showing you here is a graph on the x-axis is time from June 2011 on your far left to the far right of June 2017. The y-axis is just a measure of the clarity of the water or turbidity. That gives us an indication of how much sediment is actually being moved through the system. So dam removal started in 2000, September of 2011, and here's, I'm going to show you a picture of the dam or the reservoirs, and then the upper portion in the upper left is an uh, image of the mouth of the river uh, with laser-borne imagery. So the red area and the orange denotes higher elevation, and then the blue denotes lower elevation to give you an idea of how the mouth of the river changed as a function of the sediment. So by... April of 2012, the lower Elwha, the Elwha Dam was removed, and you could see a spike of sediment, and you could see this sediment plume coming from the river. So if I was able to take all of you, put you in a large boat, and go back in time, we could actually go through this, and what would happen is that there's only a few centimeters of, basically, of turbidity of sediment, because it's all finer material, and it would just kind of part if you will. But, and you can see that there's really not that much change to the river mouth. Now things changed in October of 2012 when the upper former reservoir, the Mills Reservoir, was exposed to the entire river system. In other words, it looked like this in the beginning and water is flowing to, from the left to the right and this is what it looked like when the whole reservoir was exposed to be eroded by the river. And that's when we saw a dramatic change in the amount of sediment, and it was consistent. It wasn't seasonal. In other words, it was just pumping out the sediment because it was essentially exposing it to that, all that erosion. And then by October of 2014, things settled down to the point where we were getting seasonal pulses of sediment. Um, but you could see how much the estuary changed during that time. That's when all the sediment, a lot of it, was deposited and started to create the estuary of the nearshore environment we see today. Um, we had several large flow events in 2015 that were over, oh, I need to calculate, let's see, divided by 35.3. Um, it's several hundred cubic meters per second of large flood events. Um, during that time that really shaped the river and also changed the estuary. Now, since 2016, the sediment levels have gone down to what was in the background. In other words, what was happening before dam removal. So if you think about it, 2011 to 2016 is not that long a time for the sediment. And that's one thing that we could say with certainty is that the biological response to dam removal takes a lot longer than the physical response. Rivers are very efficient at moving sediment. Fishing to the point where if we were standing in the mouth of the river in 2009, this is what it looked like, and this is what it looks like today. So you can see we have an estuary, we have new vegetation, we have blind tidal channels. Um, there's actually a crab, a Dungeness crab fishery there now for the tribe. So dramatic change in, in the estuary as a result of the dam removal. If we went upstream to Mills Reservoir and we were standing by this red circle, which is Boulder Creek coming in, so water is flowing from the bottom to the top, you could see how the reservoir went away. And if we were standing at the mouth of Boulder Creek in 2011 looking downstream, this is what it would look like. And if I took you there in 2019 standing in the same place, you would have two to three meters of down cutting in the, in the reservoir and you could, see the, you could see where we'd be standing relative to where the creek is. So dramatic change in a very short period of time in, in the reservoir areas. 
In the main river itself, nothing really changed in terms of the elevation of the river until that reservoir that I showed you that picture of was fully exposed to erosion. And that's when the larger material started to move downstream and build the riverbed up almost to two meters in some cases. So dramatic changes in a short period of time to the riverbed. And so this is a, a Google Earth image looking upstream um, uh, at, the, at, the, at the Elwha River. And these red lines are denoting the floodplain channels. So for every kilometer of main river coming at you, there's about two kilometers of channel in the forest itself. And I'll talk a little bit about how gravel bars and wood accumulated, how the pools filled, and then how the banks were eroded um, after the pools filled and the riverbed filled. So if we were standing at Fisherman's Bend, look, Bend looking upstream, this is what it looked like during dam removal in the beginning. Not much in terms of gravel bars or wood. And then by March 2013, you could see on the right how big the gravel bars became and how much wood came downstream, creating habitat for a fish. So uh, this, is, uh, this is what the longitudinal profile of the river looked like prior to dam removal. You could see these deep green areas going from the upper uh, right to the lower left. Those are the big pools. They all filled in in a matter of a year or two when the dam started to get, become removed, basically changing the, the geomorphology of the river. And then that's when we started to see the river move laterally across its floodplain. So the river basically went up and down vertically first, and then it started to move laterally, where these dark areas here, these highlighted black areas, basically were taken out by one flood event, um, to just give you an example of how dynamic the river was during this time. And in summary, we saw the pools fill, but now the pools uh, are unfilled. And we saw these gravel bars develop that now become forested islands, actually. And we saw these floodplain channels that I talked about, Phil, but now those areas have uh, stabilized and, and more sediment is accumulating on the floodplain itself. So dramatic changes to the salmon habitat that allow for the salmon to then eventually utilize those areas. So in summary, there was about 21 million cubic meters of sediment released. About 10% of it has been stored in the river itself, but the, mass, the vast majority, almost 90%, went out into what we, what we call the Strait of Juan de Fuca, or the marine environment, and then also created the estuary that we now see there. So now I'm going to talk about the biological response a little bit. And so one thing that we have to understand about salmon, whether you're talking about populations that start below these barriers, like dams or something else, um, in the millions, or we start in the hundreds, you could see a 100 to 400 percent increase in these salmon populations within decades of, of, of reopening that habitat. So whether you're talking about Glacier Bay in Alaska that's being, de you know, areas deglaciated or barriers that are being removed, we're seeing these dramatic changes in the population size uh, within a matter of decades. So the way salmon were reintroduced in the Elwha, now you have to always keep in mind that everybody wants to have that natural experiment occur where we're just letting fish go. You, you have to realize, though, that there's a there's a already a condition, if you will, a management condition that you have to deal with. And one of them is the fact that these are harvestable fish. There's commercial harvest associated with them. So there's hatcheries that have been part of the culture there for over 100 years. And some of the species we'll talk about that have a hatchery influence and others don't. So the comp what we saw with, uh, with coho and steelhead was a combination of assisted relocation that occurred for both coho and steelhead, but we also saw natural re reintroduction in those areas of Chinook and other species. So anytime we talk about the reintroduction of salmon on the Pacific, in the Pacific Rim, for the most part in the United States, we're talking about a combination of relocation of fish that are there, whether they're wild or hatchery, and then also natural reintroduction of fish. Um, so it varies as a function of the species and what the history of the place has. One of the other things that uh, to keep in mind is salmon are a lot like trees to measure and monitor, except you can't see them and they constantly move. So a little bit harder, shall we say. That joke did not go well. Sorry about that. <laughs> so anyway, but, um, but anyway, so we had to kind of be 
not, uh, we had to be creative of how we were actually going to measure the return of these adult fish because we couldn't see in the river anymore. It was too turbid. So sonar was one of our options. And what a sonar is is basically sound waves. And we were able to purchase some of these devices and actually put them in the river and monitor fish returning. We also used traditional techniques, which was basically enumerating and going out and seeing where they put their nests or their salmon reds in the clear water areas of the tributaries, not necessarily the main river. We had two uh, sonars in the lower part of the river that were trying to measure how many Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead were returning. This just gives you an idea of what the location looks like. You could see a, a ladder with a piece of equipment hanging in the river, these, this picket fence to kind of push fish to a certain distance so that we can actually enumerate them. And what we're finding is that we're seeing more Chinook and we're seeing more steelhead in the Elwha River, where we started prior to dam removal a little less than 3,000 returning a year. During dam removal, even during the time when we had the highest levels of sediment, we were seeing more fish return. And after dam removal, we're seeing the average increase. For steelhead, which are again ocean-going rainbow trout, particularly winter steelhead that return in the winter, we've seen a pretty dramatic increase starting in the hundreds and going into the thousands. Now this is a combination of basically fish that naturally produce there as well as hatchery fish. Much more hatchery fish for the Chinook, much less hatchery fish for the steelhead. We've also seen a very dramatic increase of coho salmon and a really interesting story here where his, historically over the last 50 years most of these fish have been hatchery fish. When released into their new areas, if you will, we've seen them really take hold and increase the numbers from hundreds to thousands in a matter of years. So this is kind of a, a, a re, uh, renaturalization of fish, if you will, with coho salmon. Now we also are trying to measure fish going out, and we have different techniques for that. And what I'm going to focus on, just to give you an example, are these uh, smolt traps or these screw traps. These are essentially a rotating screw, like an Archimedes screw in the river that actually captures fish as they're kind of migrating down as juveniles. And we have three of them in the main river and then two tributaries, Indian Creek and Little River, which I'll talk a little bit about. And what we saw there was essentially not much of a change in terms of the juveniles coming out during the dam removal and even after the dam removal, but then a big jump once the sediment kind of stabilized, we saw a very dramatic increase going from hundreds of thousands to millions of fish coming out once everything started to stabilize, at least from a habitat perspective. Chinook have done better than some of the other species, such as chum salmon and pinks, which are still trying to recover from that. So each of the species has a variable response to the dam removal so far. We've also seen a dramatic increase in Pacific lamprey, um, a 12-fold increase in a matter of three years. We've seen sockeye salmon, which basically spawn in lake environments, start to show up. But based on the genetics, they're actually not from the Elwha. They're strays from Alaska and British Columbia, which is kind of interesting in terms of thinking about how salmon reoccupy areas. So where have we seen these fish? So some of the fish exist above the dams already, such as bull trout and, and resident rainbow trout, and those are all the way up in the headwaters. So you, this map here on the left shows the headwaters of the Elwha going down uh, stream. And you can see that Chinook and Steelhead have made it all the way up. Um, we've seen sockeye, coho, and pinks um, in, the middle, in the middle part and the lower upper part, and now we're starting to see chum salmon as well. So they're starting to distribute themselves upstream. Um, in terms of numbers of spawning nests, we've gone from zero above the dams to about 1,000 a year for steelhead, chinook, and coho on average. So when we think of dam removal, we think of fish going upstream. So, oops, sorry about that. That didn't work well. Let's try it again. Okay, there we go. There's a chinook going upstream. But what we don't think about is bull trout and other fish going downstream. And utilizing the benefits of a marine environment, which has far more nutrients and other opportunities to grow. Um, we've also seen steelhead make it upstream, but we had a resident rainbow population um, that had offspring that can now go downstream all the way. And what we're seeing is kind of a reawakening of a life history strategy, if you will, for steelhead that are coming back at a different time. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And we're seeing summer steelhead come back. So the reawakening of summer steelhead is, is a very 
it's, it's very exciting for, for several of us. This was actually the first documented summer steelhead that we actually got a photo of, or John McMillan did, um, who worked with us for many years. Um, we've seen an increase in the numbers going from single digits to hundreds. And we asked the question from a genetics perspective as well, is, is there a genetic basis for this? So um, S Stephen talked to you a little bit about some of the markers and other things that, that people are using to kind of separate things out. And we asked the question, are there patterns in the low side that tell us something about steelhead reoccupying this area, particularly in the upper river? And what we looked at was a marker called the Greb1L marker, which they call a summer genotype. So this is a marker that essentially, that they find in spring Chinook and summer steelhead that differentiate them from winter steelhead or, or summer fall Chinook. And what we found based on the, the fish returning, that the fish that return in June, July, and August have this marker. And for the most part, the fish that return in March, April, and May don't necessarily have this. And this is work by Kristen Nichols and Alexandra Frake. Um, so if we start looking at this from a genetics perspective, the summer fish have this summer homozygote, and then they have the heterozygote, where the winter fish just have the winter homozygote. But more importantly, if you look at the graph on the right, and you look at the pre-data for over 2,000 fish that we collected, almost 75% of the fish that were above the dam had this summer marker, if you will. And that is part of the reason why we're seeing these summer steelhead return to the Elwha. So pretty exciting stuff. Now we've seen changes in the life history of, of bull trout, or, um, where they were long and skinny and snake-like prior to dam removal. With the dam removal and the ability to actually get to the Strait of Juan de Fuca and eat anything possible, as you can see here in the right, um, they become much larger fish, much larger, better fish condition. And that's something that we've been able to document. We've also seen the reawakening of life history, even with um, the same type of uh, genetics, if you will. So Indian Creek comes in 100 meters downstream of Little River, and they come in from directly opposite sides, where, and they have very different environmental characteristics. So Indian Creek comes in from Lake Sutherland. It's warm. It's wetland-dominated. It has coastal cutthroat trout and kokanee uh, salmon in there, which are basically landlocked sockeye. Little River coming in on the other side is cold. It's, it's, it's dominated by water coming off of snow melt. Um, very, different, very different environmental condition. To the point where when we look at the temperature over a season, what we find is that there's a two month growth advantage in Indian Creek versus Little River. In other words, it gets warmer sooner, fish come out sooner, and they're able to utilize the resources there a little bit sooner. So what does that mean? So what? Well, what we found was that if you look at the red uh, bar graphs, what we found in Indian Creek is that we both have fry migrants, in other words, smaller coho salmon, about 70 millimeters in length that migrate out of the river, out of the creek. But we also have fish that reside for one year and come out as smolts, about 150 millimeters out of the creek. Whereas in Little River, they come out later, they're all small, and they migrate out immediately with very few of them sticking around because it's cold don't have as many food resources. So even they have the same genetic makeup, we're seeing that the environmental conditions actually result in different life history strategies. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the ecosystem response and talk a little bit about bugs, uh, aquatic insects. And this is work by Sarah Morley and Jeff Duda. So we know we had a change in the sediment, which changes things such as algae, aquatic insects, and what actually fish eat. So, um, Sarah and Jeff set up a really nice study design where they have the area below, between, and above the dams. They have different habitats like the main river and the tributaries and the side channel. I'm just going to really focus on down here for now. And they have pre, during, and post data on the density of the different types of insects that you see. Um, so we're talking about mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, um, beetles, just regular flies, non insects. And you can see. Before dam removal, the density was somewhere between three and 6,000 individuals per square meter. During dam removal, there was a 95% reduction in, in aquatic insects because of the sediment. So a dramatic decrease. But you can see how it bounced back after dam removal. So the species composition changed, but we're seeing about the same numbers now, but a different species composition. 
Now, that also translates to what animals eat. So prior to dam removal, if you look at this upper bar graph here on the far left, you could see in the blue that most of the, what they were eating was of aquatic origin. So, but when dam removal started and really sedimentation happened, that shifted to terrestrial, basically. Anything that was falling in from the riparian zones, um, you know, anything that they could find because of that dramatic reduction. So the fish had to respond to the change in the, in the food as well. One of the more interesting stories, in my opinion, is the American Dipper here. Um, so you can see uh, here, it, this is a, a salmon egg. They like to eat salmon eggs. They also like to eat insects. And what, what they found was that uh, Chris Tonra from Ohio State University and also the Smithsonian Institute, he was tagging these small birds that are basically along the river corridors of these rivers across near the Elwha and other places. And then in the yellow are areas where salmon are. And in the red were areas where salmon were not. Obviously, they started to be in certain areas once the dams came out. So he was banding these birds. And what he found was that once the salmon showed up in the Elwha, there was a higher survival uh, or there was a higher survival before this in air, in air for these birds uh, where there was salmon eggs. And then once the salmon showed up, these animals started to become resident and not migratory. They wouldn't fly out anymore. They would just stay because they had food. They had salmon eggs. And they were 20 times more likely to have multiple broods in one year. So those salmon eggs, which have a lot of nutrients associated with them, changed the behavior and had productivity benefits to the population of American dippers. They're pretty cool birds. They're cute. So, um, so the wildlife also recolonized the former reservoirs. We have cougars, bobcats, bears, weasels, woodpeckers, you name it, in those areas now. Um, we have the small mammals really were the first in terms of the diversity and increase with vegetation. That's a really cute picture, I know. But um, we also had the re kind of the reemergence of beavers in areas, successfully reoccupying things. And then the deer and elk are really starting to come in now that the vegetation has come up. And we're continuing to monitor that. The vegetation changes were pretty dynamic as well. So we had the expansion of the delta that I talked to you about. So now we're seeing uh, emergent marsh vegetation in the estuary. In the river, we've seen an increase in plant species diversity as well. And um, in the reservoirs, we've seen different trajectories on what kind of vegetation we have and how much is a function of where you are, whether it's the submerged walls or the high terraces or the floodplain based on the dynamics of what's actually being disturbed there. So in summary, the dams have come out, and we've seen over half of the sediment that was stored in the river released to the river and to the estuary. We've seen most of that be transported into the, into the Strait of Juan de Fuca, but we've seen the kind of the emergence of our, of our river mouth with a 60 hectare delta. We've seen sediment stored in the river creating spawning gravels for these animals. And then we've seen fish get above the dams, all kinds of species, both hatchery and wild fish, starting to establish those populations, including Pacific lamprey. We've seen the growth benefits in terms of the fish condition for bull trout, and then the reawakening of life history strategies, such as summer steelhead. Um, the benthic inverts definitely took a hit with the sediment. Now they're coming back, and that was a shift also for the salmon diet during that time. And the American Dipper is a great example of altering the migratory behavior and the productivity benefits for salmon. And then with vegetation, really, the dam removal and the sediment flux created these new landforms, such as the delta, the river, and the former reservoirs, and we're seeing pretty dramatic changes there. So, there's a lot of publications. I could have made the font smaller, but I, I know that's kind of ridiculous. But the point is, we have a lot of data out there. If you're interested, I'd be happy to share it. And I just want to thank everybody for listening today. Thank you very much. That you're was welcome. A very, very interesting. And you managed to get a lot of other creatures in this presentation, <laughs> in addition to fish. So. Uh, Please, feel free with questions. Steve, um, uh, let's see if that yeah. one is on. No, no, no. It's okay. You can give, no? It's okay. It, um, yeah, Mike, quite well. Yeah. Aside from giving me a bad conscience because I forgot to thank the people who... <laughs> um, I just have a simple question. Do you think the system has reached the dynamic equilibrium now? Or 
can you expect many more changes? So the question was, has the system reached a dynamic equilibrium? And it's a great question because I think when people say a dynamic equilibrium, I ask the question, what part of the ecosystem are we talking about, right? And I would say that one of the things that we're learning from this process is that I think that we're going to see some changes to the physical environment, but not nearly as much as we've seen. So I think there you could safely say that we are at a dynamic equilibrium. We're not at a dynamic equilibrium with the biology in any way, by any means, because I think that um, we're just starting to see fish in certain areas. We're just starting to see vegetation change in certain areas. And there's a lag effect with certain things. So I think for the biology, it's going to take a while before we see it. I would say another 20 years, maybe, we might see something. And this is also, to give you guys context, um, uh, Mount St. Helens, which is a volcano near where we live in the Pacific Northwest, erupted in the 80s. And there was just a, a series of papers that came out on it. And they were still talking about how, even at Mount St. Helens, you know, you're, st you're still seeing changes over that time. Now the changes are less, but I think over the next 10 to 20 years, we'll, we'll start seeing some things a little bit more permanent. But right now, we're still on the trajectory going up. Okay, we have a question with our... Uh, thank you very much. It You're welcome. A, a super, super good <laughs> overview of this. Um, uh, I'm Swedish and I'm looking to, we have a lot of dams here. And uh, uh, when you talk about dynamic equilibrium, uh, do you think that the, um, uh, before you cut down the dam, was it a dynamic equilibrium there? Yes. And then we change it by taking out the dam. But was the dam before, uh, was, were they regulated? Because I'm thinking of the origin of the sediments. Were they actually from the shorelines of the the dam that was washed down. Uh, so, yeah. So, if you have a dam that is not regulated, you would would not have. You would have a better uh, biodiversity. There. Yes, I, I think so. But here's the key: you can you can manage the water, but I've never seen a dam manage the sediment. In other words, when you put a dam in, you're cutting off the sediment supply. That's just the way it is. There's no. There's, I mean, you might have bottom releases, but you're not, you're not allowing the natural sediment process to occur with a dam. It's a barrier. And so I would just say that um, I think from a hydrologic perspective, from a water perspective, you could manage rivers as run of the river, but you're still changing the geomorphology because you're not letting sediment through. And the sediment is the key to the dynamics, in my opinion. Again, I'm biased because I, I also have a ge geology, geomorphology background, but it's really critical to how these rivers structure themselves. I think we have a few questions we have from Lotta. But while I'm passing the microphone, I just would like to address a very short question. It's extremely fascinating for us in Sweden and Europe to see this detailed description of a Pacific freshwater ecosystem. And what I was a little bit uh, astonished about is the species diversity. There are a lot of salmonids and a lamprey, but it, aren't there any more fishes, scalpins? Oh, yeah, yeah, there is. There's okay. scopids. Yeah, yeah, we have okay, a lot of different ones. You only included the anadromous ones. Yeah, yeah, I just really focused on the anadromous ones because we've done, we've done work with sculpin and, and other ones and other fish as well. I mean, I'd even get into cutthroat. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's a little too much to try to do in 35 minutes, so. Before you ripped them out, did you have a plan for what it was going to look like afterwards? We're talking all the sediment coming down. Did you just let it go and see how it, how it went? Or yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, was there a sediment management plan? And there was. And I would really, I, I tip my hat to the, the people in charge of that. That was the Bureau of Reclamation, specifically uh, two people, Tim, Tim Randall and Jennifer Bountry, who were managing the, the sediment part of the project, as well as Andy Ritchie, who was on loan from the United States Geologic Survey. What they were able to do was really um, manage how much sediment was actually coming out based on the dam removal itself, because they had what we called fish windows. So we wanted fish to be able to come back at certain times, both as adults or leave as juveniles and not get basically hit hard by the sediment. So they really tried to manage that as best as they possibly could. The, the, the dam removal was on hold almost for one year because of that. 
um, where there was just so much sediment coming out, they were just like, this is way beyond what we thought, so we're just going to stop, let things settle, and then start again. And it, it definitely made a big difference. Um, so there was a management plan associated with it that I thought, um, you know, if, if, if anybody's interested in adaptive management from a natural resource perspective, it's a great example of adaptive management. Because so many times with adaptive management, what people do is they don't use the, the data or the information to change what they're actually doing because they've already invested in it you know, monetarily. So um, the, the sediment management plan was a good one. Thank you. Um, so just a quick one. I was wondering about the remigration of the wild species. It sounds to me super successful and very quick. <laughs> so I was just wondering of the proximity to other non-exploited rivers so that you could have a remigration from the nearby area. How would you say far away is this river to other unexploited rivers? Have you thought of the oh. remigration, sort of like depending on the nearness. To yeah, it, 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 so yeah, that's a really good question. So that, that was part of actually my dissertation work and some of the examples I showed you there. Really, it's a function of what's below the barrier. So in other words, while we're going to get fish from other watersheds to come in as strays, most of the fish that are coming back to the Elwha are from the Elwha. So really, it's about the population size below, the, below these barriers. So for example, one of the examples I had in the beginning I showed you as a dot was the Klamath River, which is in Oregon and California. Those dams are, are, are supposed to be coming out um, in 2023 and 2024. There's four of them. They have much bigger populations of Chinook and much bigger populations of steelhead than we do where we started the dam removal. So there, we're talking about tens of thousands of fish. So part of the success is a function of numbers, right? So the rates are going to be the same. But if you're starting at 10,000 versus starting at 300 versus starting at 1,000, it makes a huge difference. Um, you do get strays from other places, like I talked a little bit about the sockeye coming from British Columbia and Alaska. There, what's interesting about that is that we have lake-type sockeye, which is the majority of what people think about. We also have river-type sockeye. And when you look at them kind of from a um, biogeographic perspective, they're not connected. In other words, the river-type sockeye that we see in Washington State genetically are more similar to river-type sockeye in Alaska than river-type sockeye, than lake-type sockeye in their own watershed. So there's definitely this life history strategy that is connected, and we don't really know much about that. So there you go. OK, I think that must be the last question now, because we have to move on in the program. but. Of oh, course, thank a few you. Gifts for you. Lunch tickets for 300. So, thank big you. applause. Thank you. <laughs>